Good day. As is now traditional, I will start this programme with a quick review of the situation on the Ukrainian battlefronts. And it's become quite clear to me um, over the last few hours that the main focus of the fighting continues to be and remains the Bakhmut area of Donbass. I say that because there's been a fair amount of reports now about the progress of the Russian offensive in Zaporozhye. And from what I can understand, the Russians are now uh, steadily clearing, or perhaps more accurately, taking under control various villages and settlements in the Orekhov area before um, taking steps to perhaps encircle that particular town the town of Orekhov, and there's also further reports that the Russians are now consolidating their advance um, towards Zaporozhye. But I get the sense that this is an offensive um, being carried out by only a fraction of the Russian forces. Um, the main Russian offensive surely is going to come when there's 150,000, 160,000 uh, troops that the Russians are in the process of training up and reorganizing in new um, units, um, when, those, when those troops are able to join the battle. And it's now expected that that will be around March. Um, way back a few weeks ago, Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vashinin so that if the Russians do continue to follow military logic as opposed to political logic, in other words, if they take the advice of the military staffs rather than trying to accelerate events by pursuing, by trying to follow politically determined timetables, they would wait until March before launching any big offensives because that will be the time when these military units, these new military units that have been built up since the mobilization in September are ready to go into battle. And I get the sense that this is exactly what is happening. Now, in the meantime, the Russians, as I said, are pressing forward incrementally in Zaporozhye. As I said, they do seem to be clearing uh, locations around Orekhov. They're pushing towards Zaporozhye city along the east bank of the Dnieper River. And just before this program began, there were further reports, this time from the um, militia leader, the militia, senior militia officer of the Donet, Donbass militia, militia, the Donetsk militia, the head of the Vostok battalion, Alexander Khodakovsky, who is, by the way, one of the more reliable commentators um, on the Russian side on the, of what is actually happening on the battlefields. Hodakovsky says that he and other Russian forces have received an order to resume the advance on Vugleda and that fighting has already started there and that the Russians are making progress and that the Ukrainians in this area were caught by surprise. Now, I'm not by any means sure that this is the case. I mean, this is, of course, Khodorkovsky who's saying this. I wonder whether the Ukrainians were, in fact, caught by surprise in exactly the way that they say. But anyway, that is what Khodorkovsky is saying. Now, that means that we have Russian advances in Zaporozhye, a Russian advance of some kind around Vugleda, and, well, a few days ago I talked about some kind of Ukrainian counterattack in the Svatovo Kremenaya area. Well, that doesn't seem to have gone very far, and from what I've been able to gather, the Russians are back on the attack in that area as well. But all of these attacks in Zaporozhye region, in southern Donetsk region around Vugleda, in Kremenaya, Svatovo, they all seem to me to be tactical advances, if I can use that term, 
I'm probably using that expression wrongly, but I hope you all understand what I mean. In other words, advances carried out by limited forces, certainly not an advance by hundreds of thousands of men intended to break Ukrainian defences, to roll up Ukrainian forces. So what is the purpose of all of these attacks? Well, Brian Boletic at the New Atlas yesterday gave a series of explanations of what it is that the Russians might be doing in all of these various attacks in places like Zaporozhye and um, Vugledar and Svatovo Kremenaya. And he suggested that they could be reconnaissance in force or they could be the Russians pushing forward in order to take control of more areas in what's called the grey zone. In other words, advance their front lines further forward in anticipation of whatever counteroffensive the Ukrainians might be thinking of launching in time. And, of course, a third possibility is that these are indeed offensives intended to capture and control territory. I think that's probably correct on all fronts, but I would say that, in my opinion, there is another motivation, and it is, I suspect, the bigger one, which is to maintain pressure on Ukraine all across the front line, whilst the big battle, the really important battle, the Battle of Bakhmut, continues and uh, um, evolves into uh, uh, and until the Russians are able to fully secure control, not just of Bakhmut, but of the very large Ukrainian forces, are able to defeat the very large Ukrainian forces in and around Bakhmut conclusively. I say that because, in fact, over the last couple of hours, even whilst there's been a lot of discussion about the advances in Zaporozhye especially, the information about Vugladar has only just come through. Um, there's actually been quite a lot of information about what's been going on around Bakhmut. The first thing I would say is that I've now seen video film of fighting inside the village of Krasnaya Gora, which is located to the north of Bakhmut, basically between Bakhmut and Solidar. And I've also seen more reports of shelling of Chasov Yar or of the areas around Chasov Yar to the west of Bakhmut. There's also been reports that another uh, Ukrainian village, another village under Ukrainian control to the north of Bakhmut, a place which I have trouble <laughs> pronouncing, but I believe it's called Paraskovia is also now um, so intensely contested and that continues to tighten the ring around Bakhmut itself. And of course there was also those reports which still continue of fighting in and around Ivanovka, a town, a village I'm going to continue to call Ivanovka, um, though the Russians, as I said, refer to it as Krasnoye. Well, Denis Bushilin, the head of the uh, regional government of the Donetsk People's Republic, this is, of course, a Russian-appointed official, has uh, given an interview um, early this morning to Russian television, and this is the Russian official news agency TASS's report of that, um, of that interview. And it reads as follows. The noose is tightening around Ukraine's forces with a single road to, I'm going to call it Bakhmut, he refers to it Artyomovsk, remaining available as all other routes have been cut off, uh, Denis Bushilin revealed on Russian television on Tuesday. Undoubtedly, here we have to speak carefully, we can derive more from Ukrainians' resources and according to them, there is just one road left that makes it possible to reach Artyomovsk relatively safely. 
Pushilin specified that other supply routes had been closed off after the liberation of Solidar. Of course, he says liberation, the Ukrainians and people in the West would say capture of Solidar. Uh, something, uh, a capture of Solidar, by the way, which the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian military have still not acknowledged. Anyway, to continue, our guys are advancing and now towards well, he says Artyomovsk, I will continue to say Bakhmut. We are seeing important changes, Pushilin said. He noted that the community of Krasnopolyevka had been cleared on Monday with a mop-up of Dvorechye underway. As far as we are concerned, the heights around Kleshevka were certainly important. This made it possible to gain operational control over the supply routes for Siversk and Artyomovsk. So we see that from Pushilin's point of view, the ring is closing around the Ukrainian troops still in Bakhmut. And by the way, um, shortly before I started making this program, there were reports that the Ukrainians were trying themselves to blow up bridges north of Bakhmut, on the railway lines. I understand the purpose of that is to try to slow down the Russian advance towards Siversk. And anyway, that, I strongly suspect, remains the main focus of the battle. And that, of course, brings us back to that report uh, by the BND, the German Intelligence Agency, which briefed uh, the Bundestag uh, last week, uh, the German parliament, about the development of the situation in Bakhmut. It said that Ukraine is losing uh, troops in numbers of troops in three figures every day in the fighting around Bakhmut. Um, that's not quite clear. How many? I mean, three figures could be 100 or it could be 999. But anyway, one gets the sense that they mean the BND is saying that lots of Ukrainians are uh, becoming casualties in this fight in Bakhmut, in and around Bakhmut. And the BND also said that if Bakhmut does indeed fall under Russian control, which, as I have long been saying, is ultimately inevitable, unless there is some dramatic change in the course of the war that will open up the possibility for Russian advances in all sorts of places. And I've no doubt that that, by the way, is true. And I discussed a few days ago an article by Big Serge in which he explained the importance of Bakhmut and why capturing Bakhmut is going to create a major crisis with respect to Ukrainian positions in Donbass. And I noticed Brian Baletic also talking about how the fall of Solidar is already creating possibly <laughs> some of the conditions in the Donbass battlefields that resembled those that happened further north in the Lugansk region back in the summer when the important fortified town of Popaznaya was also captured by the Russians. And I don't want to say more than uh, Brian Baletic said. He said it's still early and, you know, this is an evolving situation and we don't yet know that Solidar is indeed equivalent to Popaznaya, but perhaps it is. Anyway, that's, it seems to me, where we are on the battlefields. We have Advances in Zaporozhye by the Russians, advances apparently in Vugledar, near Vugledar by the Russians as well. There have been reports, by the way, which I haven't touched on here, of more fighting by the Russians pushing further in the Marinka area uh, near Donetsk City. I'm not going to go into the details of that because I don't actually have many details, but apparently there's reports there and of the Russians continuing to apply pressure in the Svatovo-Kremenaya area. Um, whatever 
offensive the Ukrainians appear to have been planning there. Apparently, it's not been it's not been acted acted upon. And there was also a rather intriguing report from Ukrainian sources um, a few days ago about Russian reconnaissance groups operating along the northern border of Ukraine near the town, or rather I should say the city of Sumy. Sumy is a fairly large place. The Russians briefly occupied it in March, though um, apparently they pulled out of it fairly quickly as they moved forces through Sumy towards Kiev. That was all in the early days of the fighting in, uh, in this conflict. Um, Sumy was then basically surrounded by the Russians. Um, they didn't try to maintain control of Sumy. Some Russians, by the way, think that was a serious mistake. But anyway, um, a lot of that apparently going on during the fighting in um, March. And we see Russian reconnaissance troops now probing that very area in and around Sumy. Who knows to what purpose and for what reason. So we'll see what's happening. But as I said, my own clear view is that the focus of the battle remains, of the war, remains Bakhmut. And the Russian military obviously are never going to share their plans. But I suspect that's been the case from the outset. Way back in March, I was saying that the fighting that was going around, going on around Kiev was the, was the sideshow. For the Russians, the focus was Donbass. And I've been saying that fairly consistently throughout, the, throughout this conflict. And I believe that's still the case. Now, the reason I'm saying that, by the way, is because the Russians say it themselves. Russian commanders say very little about their plans. They're very, very cautious to provide as little information as possible about what they're going to do. The chief of the Russian general staff, General Gerasimov, who is now, of course, the overall commander of Russian forces in the conflict area. He gave an interview, by the way, to a Russian newspaper, Argumenti e Facti. I read it through carefully. Um, it was very interesting in the sense that it told us absolutely nothing about what the Russians are planning to do in Donbass. Uh, Gerasimov kept it all very, very secret, as the Russians tend to do. The only thing he said, by the way, was that the mobilisation uh, um, that took place in September and early October was uh, that all kinds of teething problems had to be sorted out and that he had his work out, cut out sorting out those teething problems, but that this was all those pre problems were successfully surmounted. And by the way, and for the record, the interview also came with a prominent photograph in which Gerasimov is shown working over a map with none other than General Surovikin, who I think, and by the way, the Defence Minister Shoigu was also shown in this photograph, but Surovikin's presence reinforces the view that he remains very much in, uh, um, you know, a, a key member of the team, probably the main person on the battlefields. So certainly no sign of him being demoted there. But anyway, it was... An interview in which Gerasimov said, as I said, incredibly little. But when Russian officers do talk about the war, about Russian objectives, it's striking that they always talk first and foremost about Donbass. They continue to emphasize that it is breaking Ukrainian resistance in Donbass clearing Donbass, bringing Donbass entirely under control, that remains their overriding priority. And given what's been written and said about how difficult it is to break Ukrainian defences there because of the peculiarities of the topography, 
the heavily urbanized nature of Donbass, the heavy, the, the huge fortifications that Ukraine built in Donbass over the last eight years, <clears throat> um, the overwhelming concentration of Ukrainian forces in Donbass, you can see why, for all the discussions about other places, there is, it is Donbass that remains the main battlefield. That doesn't mean that other things aren't happening in other places. The Russians have just issued a uh, claim that there was some kind of Ukrainian attempt to uh, cross the Dnieper River into East Kherson region, east of the Dnieper, that the Russians spotted the Ukrainian concentrations, that they launched heavy artillery shelling of the Ukrainian troops who'd been gathering west of the Dnieper River, that 100 Ukrainian soldiers were killed, that Ukrainian infantry fighting vehicles were destroyed, all that sort of thing. So, you know, things like that go on. And apparently there were Ukrainian attempts about a week ago to try and capture some of the islands in the Dnieper River. The Russians claimed that those were repelled and that the Ukrainians were driven out. And then there were also claims from the Ukrainian side that they launched some kind of successful landing on the Kinburn Spit, which is the part of the east bank of the Dnieper River that projects into the sea, fairly close to Ukrainian-controlled territory. Again, the Russians say that there was such an attempt, but it was unsuccessful. Anyway, so things are going on there, but the main battlefronts, the main battle continues to be very much in Donbass, and specifically now around Bakhmut, and we see that the Russians are continuing to make progress, and we see that the Ukrainians themselves consider this to be the most important battlefront, because despite all the reports and rumours and suggestions about General Zeluzhny giving advice to President Zelensky about pulling back from places like Servesk and Bakhmut, the Ukrainians continue to hold their ground there. They continue to try and uh, retain control of places like Seversk and Bakhmut. They won't even formally, officially acknowledge the loss of Solidar. They too see the Battle of Donbass, the major battle of the war, as critical for the outcome of this conflict. That, it seems to me, is clear from all sides. Now, that, as I said, is my discussion of the events on the battlefields today. Um, overall, continued Russian progress, gradually tightening the noose around Bakhmut. Perhaps the Russians have something even more ambitious in, pla in mind. I've discussed in previous programs how these, this huge concentration of Ukrainian troops in and around Bakhmut trying to defend the place must be, from a, a Russian perspective, a tempting target. But the Russians keeping up the pressure in other places, in Zaporozhye, now in Vugladar, apparently for some time now, in the Svatovo Kremenaya area, keeping the Ukrainians distracted, keeping them guessing, as we see with these reconnaissance units that have been sent in and around Sumy, keeping the Ukrainians distracted and uncertain about where the main blow from the Russians will come. So that's, it seems to me, the situation on the battlefronts. There's been a lot of other things, which I'm not going to get into the details of. There's been a, a, a claim from a top Ukrainian official that there's been an adjustment to Russian battlefield tactics, that the Russians um, are advancing more carefully and incrementally than they did in the spring, that they're not sending long armoured columns um, deep into uh, Ukrainian territory, that they're being careful to protect, ensure the protection of their flanks, that they've given up 
on the concept of the battalion tactical group. This is something that a lot of military people have been talking about, these military formations that the Russians have created, that the Russians have returned to a brigade and division structure. Well, that's the sort of thing that military people are better positioned to discuss than me. But anyway, for what it's worth, the Ukrainians do concede, appear to concede, that these incremental Russian advances under the cover of this massive artillery are remorseless and that the Ukrainians themselves have little real opportunity to stop them. Well, let's now turn to something very interesting that's been happening in Kiev. Now, a few days ago, there was this very strange announcement the, uh, of um, the sudden dismissal of Zelensky's spin doctor, Alexei Arestovich. Now, this is an odd affair because what precipitated Arestovich's sacking was that he reported that he, he, he gave an interview in which he said that the reports that the Russians had launched a missile strike on a residential building in Dniepro were wrong, that this was um, caused by um, action taken by the Ukrainian air defence, and there was an outcry against him. He then attempted to resign, and then his, his res resignation was not accepted, and he was instead sacked. All rather, rather strange and rather um, inexplicable. I, I could not understand why Aristovich would give an interview in which he appeared to contradict the official Ukrainian line that this was a deliberate Russian missile strike against a residential building. It, didn't see, it seemed very out of character for him to do that. And it did make me wonder whether there might be some story behind it. And then a, a day or so later, there was this um, helicopter crash in which the Ukrainian interior minister and the senior officials of the interior ministry were all um, killed. There's been lots of speculation as to the cause, suggestions it was an accident. That still seems the official view. But all sorts of rumours swirling around of dark deeds of this man and his team having been killed in some kind of assassination attempt. Not sure what to make of those rumours, by the way. I still haven't seen anything that confirms that that is the case. But anyway, since then and over the last couple of days, especially since yesterday, we've seen mass dismissals of Ukrainian officials. And some of these officials are very senior people. Um, uh, there's a man called Kirill Timoshenko, who was a major figure within Zelensky's own team, rather like Arestovich himself was. There's been several ministers of the, and top officials of the Ukrainian government. There's been Ukrainian regional officials who have been sacked and dismissed as well. Um, some people are talking about a purge. Well, that might be a bit too strong, but certainly there does seem to be a sudden, dramatic clear-out of top people in Ukraine. And all of this has come following a really astonishing, a very extraordinary interview given by Kirill Bodanov, who is the head of Ukrainian military intelligence. Now, Budanov, over the course of this interview, claimed that the negotiations which took place in March between Ukraine and Russia, that these were carried out, well, they were not conducted in good faith by Ukraine, 
that the Ukrainians never had any serious intention of agreeing to any kind of coming to any kind of agreement with the Russians, and that it was all intended to uh, distract and the Russians and get them to stall their advances into Ukraine in March, at a time when Ukraine was mobilising, and that the Istanbul, the draft Istanbul agreement that was hammered out in Istanbul at a meeting chaired by President Erdogan of Turkey, that that was all uh, really bogus, that Ukraine never really intended to um, implement the Istanbul Agreement. Now, that may all be true, by the way, but I do wonder, I mean, if that was the case, I do wonder why um, Prime Minister Johnson of Britain had to act so quickly to try to get the Istanbul Agreement torpedoed, why he felt the need both to telephone Zelensky and then to visit Kiev and tell Zelensky that the British would not support an agreement on the lines of what had been agreed in Istanbul and that if Ukraine went ahead with it, that uh, the British would refuse to give security guarantees and apparently the United States said the same. So that suggests to me, actually, that this was, at some level, or on the part of some people in Ukraine, a serious negotiation. But anyway, Budanov is coming out now and saying that it wasn't. And that, by the way, is going to have immediate consequences. It's going to make the Russians even more sceptical about the merits of conducting negotiations with Ukraine. The Russians have come under considerable pressure from all sorts of people, the Chinese, the South Africans, the Indians, to try and find some kind of negotiated solution to the Ukrainian crisis. They'll be able to take this interview of Budanovs and circulate it and show it to all of these people and say, look, these are the people you're asking us to negotiate with. Even their own intelligence chief, their own military intelligence chief, admits that when they did try and negotiate with us, they were not acting in good faith. It was all a trick in order to stall our advance. And given that these people do not negotiate with us in good faith, what is the sense of us negotiating with them at all? But then we have the most bizarre aspect of the whole uh, of the whole thing, because Budanov then made a truly extraordinary claim, or rather, admission. Now, at the time of the negotiations in March, one of the negotiators, a man called Denis Kireyev, um, mysteriously died, and subsequently there was confirmation that he'd been killed. And this is something, by the way, that uh, we discussed extensively on the Duran at the time, and which I think I discussed also on my on this channel. And there were rumours that Kireyev had been murdered. There was no arrest, no trial. It was, it was an extrajudicial killing, a murder, by the Ukrainian security service, the SBU. And... The suggestion was that Kirev was some sort of agent of Moscow's and that the SPU eliminated him for that reason, even though he was part of Ukraine's negotiating team meeting with the, um, meeting with the Russian negotiating team headed by a man called Medinsky. Well, Budanov has now come forward and has confirmed that Kirev was indeed murdered by the SBU. But he says that Kirev was actually one of his agents, that he was actually acting on behalf of Ukrainian military intelligence. And it's not clear to me whether Budanov said that 
the SBU, SBU knew that when they murdered Kirev, but some of the reports that I've seen suggest that the SBU did know that. Now, that is really remarkable. That is really quite extraordinary, and it does beg the question of what was going on and what is still going on between these various Ukrainian intelligence and security agencies. It does create a rather dark picture of the nature of Ukrainian politics and the way in which Ukrainian uh, affairs are conducted at the highest level. I would add, for what it's worth, that this confirmation from Budanov that Kirev was indeed murdered by the Ukrainian security service. And I want to stress, it was Budanov who confirmed this. This is not speculation anymore. Well, that does make one wonder now whether the helicopter crash, which killed the um, interior minister of Ukraine, whether that might have been an assassination after all, and part of the internecine fighting that seems to take place at this high level between Ukrainian security and intelligence services. Anyway, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not, I can't, I'm not, I don't want to speculate about this, but as I said, if Budanov does float these ideas, does, does confirm, as I said, that Kirev was murdered, it does make one wonder about what else might be going on. Anyway, Budanov gives this interview, and then a couple of days later, we have this mass dismissal of Ukrainian officials, which has come, by the way, um, with a order from Ukraine's National Security and Defence Council, which is, in my opinion, the true decision maker in Ukrainian policies, politics, that none of these officials are allowed to leave Ukraine. And there's already reports of one of them, Kirill Timoshenko, the man I spoke about before, who was close to um, Zelensky, has supposedly attempted to do so, supposedly taking money with him. Well, there is an enormous amount of speculation and theorising about what this is all about. The official line is that this is all part of some massive anti-corruption drive. And it might be. But I would point out that in the, this is, if this is an anti-corruption drive, then given that Zelensky was elected to office back in 2019, it has taken a very long time to, um, to happen. But, of course, there are other rumours. And Vladimir Rogov, who is um, a top official of the um, Russian-appointed government of Zaporozhye, has perhaps inevitably now linked this mass dismissal of officials and appointment of new officials to the visit to Kiev last week of the director of the CIA, William Burns. And Rogov is now articulating what is a very popular theory um, in the Russian media. I want to stress this is a Russian theory. No evidence that it's true, that I can see no independent evidence that it's true, but I pass it on for what it's worth. He suggests that what's actually happening is that the, there's actually some kind of a conflict going on, not just within Ukraine, between different parts of the Ukrainian power structure, but between the Americans and the British. <laughs> and supposedly the Americans are now moving to clear out from the top, of the Ukrainian power structure, various officials who have historically been connected to Britain. Now, I've seen no evidence to that. 
And I'm going to say straight away, I really wonder whether that's possible and whether Britain really does have that level of influence in Kiev. I would have thought it extremely unlikely indeed. And given that the Americans and the British work in harness, why would the Americans want to drive out people in the Ukrainian government who are indeed connected to Britain if that were indeed if they if they really were connected in that kind of way. But anyway, lots of rumours, speculations about what is going on. I don't know what exactly is going on in Kiev, but I'm going to say straight away that I don't think it is plausible that this sudden explosion of dismissals is related to um, anti-corruption issues. I would have thought that was extremely unlikely by this stage in Zelensky's presidency and by this stage in the war. It does seem to me that some kind of power struggle is taking place, that some faction has lost out in this power struggle. And I wonder whether Burns is trip to Kiev might actually have been in, involved in this whole incident in some, in some way. And I do wonder whether the true story of this affair is whether there might have been some possible challenge to President Zelensky's authority and whether this mass dismissal might have been an attempt either by Zelensky and with American backing to nip it in the bud or whether perhaps alternatively it might have been an attempt by someone to weaken Zelensky's authority in Kiev even further. Now, I think that's all I can say about this, but certainly the media in Ukraine in Russia is buzzing with this story. It's perhaps getting more more uh, focus even than the news from the battlefields, which, as I've said already, is not going well at all for Ukraine. Now, there's been more discussion uh, about tank deliveries to Ukraine, and there's been some very interesting commentaries about this. Now, Brian Belletic has done another outstanding video on his uh, uh, channel, uh, The New Atlas, um, where he discusses at length the um, enormous difficulties of um, integrating Abrams tanks into the Ukrainian military. And by the way, I've seen reports in the Daily Telegraph, and by the way, in in the TASS, the Russian TASS news agency, which suggests that the number of the total number of tanks, Western tanks, that have been talked about, is indeed around a hundred, of which the bulk, the great majority of which, will be Leopard twos. Um, there was a press conference which Macron and Scholz attended, jointly attended, they were talking about gas issues and all those sort of things, important issues, which I will perhaps come to some later time. But Macron made some comments about tank deliveries. And I have to say, I got the distinct impression that Macron was ruling out deliveries of Leclerc tanks to Ukraine. He said that um, France would only supply tanks if this did not weaken French security. As I've discussed in previous programmes, there are not actually that many Leclerc tanks in the French military arsenal. I got the distinct impression that Macron was speaking in a way that was designed to rule out deliveries of Leclerc tanks. So it looks as if it's only the Leopard 2 that is really at issue. And there's been further comments from the United States that deliveries of American 
Abrams tanks is categorically ruled out. And Brian Baletic in this program on the new Atlas, he provided a uh, very fine discussion of um, a Twitter thread um, by Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling of the US military, uh, um, a senior US military officer, military commander, somebody who's commanded 40,000 men and who has an armor background. He was an armor commander and uh, General Hurtling, Lieutenant General Hurtling, basically takes us through all the enormous problems in supplying Abrams tanks to Ukraine and refutes all sorts of really bizarre and weird theories about um, the maintenance of Abrams tanks. Supposedly, maintaining the engine would be uh, easy for Ukraine because they're accustomed to maintaining jet engines and the tank engine of the Abrams is similar to a jet engine. Well, General Hurtling refutes that. I'm not going to go over the details of that thread because um, Brian Baletic does it outstandingly well. But there's been another report by um, another US officer, senior officer, who has experience of tank warfare, and that is Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. Now, Daniel Davis uh, um, engaged so, uh, um, Iraqi T-72s during Desert Storm back in uh, 1991, I believe, and he provides an account of the battle and he discusses there the differences between the Abrams and the T-72 and between the two armies. And I'm going to read it in full. It's from 1945 uh, American military website. The United States seems enormously rich in these websites. But anyway, this is what um, Daniel Davis has to say, and this is based on his own experiences as an officer who has commanded tanks, US tanks, in battle. And I think that makes his knowledge of this sort of thing extremely valuable. He says, in Desert Storm, US M1 a1 Abrams tanks wiped out Saddam Hussein's fleets of Soviet-made T-72s. And again, the American Abrams-led invasion in 2003 revealed the T-72 was no match for US tanks. And truly, the American tanks were witheringly successful. During Desert Storm, the U.S. and its coalition partners destroyed more than 3,000 Iraqi tanks. Saddam's armoured force, however, did not destroy even a single Abrams tank. It's understandable, then, why anyone, everyone, anyone would want to have an Abrams or equivalent tank. And here, by the way, he specifically mentions the Leopard 2. Um, it's in the headline. I'm not going to go into more details about that especially when it has proven so effective against exactly the type of tanks Russia has. Now, before I proceed, I do want to qualify that from um, other um, information that I've seen, which is that the T-72s that were operated by the Iraqi military in 1991 and 2003 are not comparable, apparently, to the T-72s and T-90s operated by the Russians. Uh, most of Saddam's T-72s were not actually made in Russia. They were apparently made in Poland. They were equivalent of first-generation T-72s um, of the sort developed in the 1970s. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't have the kind of compound armour packages that... Russian, modern Russian T-72s have, or the sophisticated um, guidance systems and um, firing fire control systems that modern 
uh, Russian T-72s possess, and they don't have the reactive armor packages that modern Russian T-72s have. So we're not actually talking about exactly comparable tanks, but nonetheless, they were Soviet-era tanks, and they are, if you like, the progenitors of the T-72s that the Russians use today, even if they're not identical. And of course, I should quickly add that, of course, I'm assuming that American tanks of the 1990s have also now evolved and are more advanced and sophisticated and powerful than they were back in 1991 when uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis led them into battle. But I think that is a point to make. We would be looking into, we would be looking at different tanks today, not exactly the same tanks that we saw, that Daniel Davis is talking about. But I don't think this takes away from the force of what he's now going to say, and I'm going to continue with the rest of his article, which I think becomes even more interesting. He says this, the problem, though, is in understanding why the Abrams were so successful and the T-72 so poor. The tank is only as good as the individuals operating it and as good as the units that employ it. I fought with Eagle Troop of the 2nd Squadron, 2nd Armoured Cavalry Regiment at the Battle of 73 Easting, in which we destroyed scores of Soviet-era tanks and other armoured vehicles whilst not losing a single tank or Bradley fighting vehicle on our side. The reasons as was broadly true throughout that war, were twofold. First, the US crewmen were highly trained as individuals. In my unit, tank drivers, loaders, gunners, and vehicle commanders had all mastered their individual jobs. Then, for more than a year before battle, had conducted considerable time training as platoons, then at company level, and later we trained in squadrons and eventually regimental levels. No one could have been more ready to fight than we were. Second, had Iraq had done virtually none of those things, we later discovered their crew members had minimal training, had rarely, if ever, fired their main guns in training, did very little unit-level training, and their maintenance programs, far more important in tank operations than commonly understood, was virtually non-existent. In short, the T-72 operators were poorly trained, whilst our side were highly trained. In tank fights, the side, the side that accurately fires first almost always wins. In Desert Storm, we almost always fired first and, because of our training, almost never missed. But even when the Iraqi gunners got off a shot, it was rarely on target. The results were fatal for them. Here is a little-known fact. If the Iraqis had had the same M1A1s that we had, or we, f we had been outfitted with the same T-72s Iraq had, we still would have won, because ultimately it is the man operating the tools of war that wins, not the tools themselves. Without question, the Abrams is superior in every way to any Soviet-era tank. And of course, bear in mind what I'm saying. The Russian tanks today are not Soviet-era tanks, and the latest T-90, T-90M Povrev is an entirely new, well, almost entirely new tank. But I'm not going to get into that because as I said, this is not my areas of expertise. But then he goes on to say, but without proper training and maintenance, even an M1 can be defeated. The Abrams or Leopards are not wonder weapons whose possession will result in major successes on the Ukrainian battlefield. They can help, they will provide improved capability over the current Ukrainian fleet, but the nature of this war is such that there have been few tank-on-tank -tank engagements, 
and to date virtually no tank battles. But to demonstrate why adding M1s isn't going to meaningfully alter battlefield dynamics, I will provide a realistic scenario. And then he discusses the battles in Kherson region during the Ukrainian offensive. And he concludes <laughs> that had Ukraine been in possession of M1 tanks, American tanks, or indeed Leopard 2s, it would have changed very little. Even if Ukraine had had the M1 Abrams tanks opposite Kherson, the battle would not have materially changed. So that's Lieutenant Colonel Davis, and he's somebody who, as I said, has fought with tanks in battle. And he, by the way, does make some observations about the T-72. He talks out about how it has a lethal gun and that this could be, he says, the, U, the T-72 still have decent armour protection and lethal cannons at shorter ranges. NATO tanks are not impervious to T-72 tank shots. A flank or rear shot by a T-72, T-80 or T-90 can still disable or destroy an M1 Abrams tank and can easily destroy every other tracked or wheeled, wheeled vehicle in Ukraine's inventory. Tanks cannot fight alone or they die, often to anti-tank missiles. And we've seen that in many wars. We saw that when, of course, the Turkey tried to use um, um, Leopard 2 tanks in Syria against the Kurds and against ISIS. And we've seen it also when the Saudis have attempted to use um, American tanks against um, Yemeni fighters in the long war in Yemen. So there we go. They're not a game changer. And why is there this enormous fuss then about supplying Ukraine with these tanks? Well, that's Lieutenant Colonel Davis's view. I think in complete fairness, I should give a different view by another um, tank officer, somebody who is a fervid supporter of supplying tanks to Ukraine. And this is um, uh, um, Colonel Hamish. I believe he's a colonel. I may be getting his rank wrong. If so, I apologise in advance. Hamish de Breton Gordon, a British army officer. And um, he says um, he says that he is um, familiar with operating all the latest British tanks. He says, I converted from the Chieftain to the Challenger 1, and then from the Challenger 1 to the Challenger 2. And that as second in command of the 2nd Royal Tank Regiment, I converted 500 tank soldiers from the Challenger 1 to the Challenger 2. And he then says that, while well, I'm oversimplifying it, Challenger 2 is essentially PlayStation technology for firing the gun and using the tank. So easy to assimilate for anybody under 30, which I expect most Ukrainian tank crews are. And from a maintenance perspective, I found the Challenger 2 hugely reliable. My last experience in a Challenger 2 was on a major exercise in Canada, where my tank went to... 1,500 miles without a problem. Many of the systems in a Challenger 2 are plug and play, with major components like engines being replaced in short order if problems arise. Little a challenge, I expect, for Ukrainian mechanics. Doesn't say, by the way, well, he doesn't discuss the fact that presumably if you're going to change the engine, you need lots of replacement engines, but you know, I'm not going to go into all of that. And he goes on to say, Britain has support, been supporting a battle group of Challenger 2s in Estonia for some time, so logistic lines are in place across Europe, and we still have significant Challenger 2 infrastructure in Germany. Allied to this is a vast tank training area in Poland, <laughs> 
where many of us have spent too much time at, but may be ideal to familiarise Ukrainian tank crews with Challenger 2 fire and manoeuvre capabilities. So here we see, um, um, well, I, I, I'm not going to try and guess his rank. Hey, Mr. Breton Gordon, a British tank officer. Um, he thinks that operating the Challenger 2 would not be a problem and that the Ukrainians could learn to use it in very short order and that all the issues of logistics, of training and all of that discussed by Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, L Lieutenant General Mark Hurdling, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, Brian Balletic, all of those, that these problems really don't exist, that we can have all of these tanks operating on the Ukrainian battlefields in no time. Well, I suppose that's a point of view. I have to say, based on everything that I've heard and seen about tanks and my perhaps only minimally relevant knowledge of operating heavy vehicles, I think that I still prefer, on balance, the opinions of people like um, Lieutenant General Hurtling, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, Brian Balletic, and others, as to the sheer complexity and difficulty of operating with these vehicles on the Ukrainian battlefields. And I still insist contrary to what Hamish de Brett and Gordon thinks, that this is the wrong landscape anyway for operating vehicles in that kind of way. The long lands wrong landscape and the wrong battle, battle region. And I think that, by the way, if anybody comes along and tells me that Canada, where Hamish de Brett and Gordon trained, um, and Ukraine are similar... I would say that there are certain similarities, but of course, and I'm sure of this, Canada will have a more developed road and railway system, developed road system certainly than Ukraine will, probably stronger bridges, let's guess. But of course, anyway, it is a Western economy and it would make it easier to operate Western tanks there whereas Ukraine is a former Soviet republic operating still within Soviet industrial and road structures. So I don't think that the similarity is as great as perhaps some will say. Anyway, I've set out the two opposing views. I made it absolutely clear which I prefer. Now, where are we in this war? It looks, again, to me, as if things are not going well for Ukraine in Bakhmut. Note what Lieutenant Colonel Davis says. It took the Americans a year to hone their training to the level when they were superbly fit for battle in the first Gulf War. Ukraine doesn't have a year, doesn't have anywhere close to that amount of time. Perhaps it doesn't need it. Perhaps, you know, the tankers on the other side, the Russians, are not up to the standard of American tankers in the first Gulf War. I am absolutely willing to believe that. But the Leopard 2, the other Western tanks, are entirely new kit. There's something that Ukraine has no experience operating. Um, it's not just that the tank soldiers, the operators, will have to learn all of the intricacies of operating with these machines. And it's also, of course, the case that the officers who will be commanding the units that operate these machines will have to learn the differences, the obvious differences, the certain differences between these tanks and the kind of tanks they're used to. I, I'm assuming that you can't take um, a company of Leopard 2s and operate them in the same way as you would operate a company of T-64s, uh, the kind of tank Ukraine has had. These are different tanks. They have different 
peculiarities. If you try and use them in the same way, then you're probably not making the most, taking the most advantage of the Leopard 2s, and you might be operating them in a way that exposes their flaws. So, given that this is so, coming back to what we said, coming back to what Colonel Davis has said, Lieutenant Colonel Davis has said, what is the point of supplying Ukraine with around 100 tanks? Which I suspect, by the way, is all there is to spare. I don't think that there are hundreds and hundreds of tanks available to provide Ukraine. Um, we'll probably get cobble together perhaps a hundred tanks all right maybe a few more than that but it's not going to make a decisive difference in the battlefront battlefields and what we see is ukraine facing an emerging crisis in bakhmut now this is probably going to take several weeks perhaps months to develop but if these tanks are thrown into battle quickly, these Western tanks are thrown into battle quickly, they will be destroyed, they will be lost. And that, we know, is the advice the Americans are giving the Ukrainians. So, given that things are going so critically wrong at this time, why supply these tanks at all? And that perhaps takes me back to, these, to this massive clear-out of people in Kiev. Now, we've, I've discussed all the rumours, speculations and reasons that have been given about um, why these people have been dismissed, that it's a part of an anti-corruption drive, though I don't believe that, that it's some kind of power play between hardline, uh, between... Um, uh, various factions in the intelligence services. But it's also possibly connected to um, shoring up President Zelensky's position. There is one other possibility, and here I'm going to say straightforwardly that the wish on my part is the father to the thought. I don't know that this is true. But perhaps someone in Washington and Burns, who was the former U.S. ambassador to Moscow, could be that person. Someone in Washington is looking at the situation in Ukraine, is understanding that there is indeed a tipping point coming in the war. And that tipping point is looking extremely bad for Ukraine indeed. And then that person is now saying that there have to be some sort of in earnest negotiations to end this war. And perhaps what we are seeing is a clear out of people in Kiev who might have been expected to make difficulties if negotiations started. So... Budanov is talking about, he, he's, he's putting the SBU in the frame. He's talking about how they murdered this man, Kireyev. Perhaps we're going to see a clear out of people in the SBU, an organization which is perhaps one of the more hardline groups within Ukraine. Perhaps there's others. And perhaps that's the real purpose of this purge if it is a purge, it's intended to put in charge in Kiev people who might be more willing to resume negotiations with the Russians. And note Budanov's very strange comments about how the negotiations in March were conducted in bad faith. This time, perhaps the Russians will be re reassured that the new team that's going to be heading the negotiations is actually a more serious one. Well, I would like to hope so. I don't know whether this is true. I suspect it isn't. But maybe.
just maybe we're starting to see some step, some serious step to clear out, as I said, people who might obstruct negotiations in order to try to find some way to get not just Ukraine, but the various Western politicians who've overinvested in this war. First and foremost, the Biden administration to get them out of the hole in which they've dug themselves into. Well, that's me for the day. More from me soon. And I'll obviously um, keep you all informed about future developments, both on the battlefields, and we'll, no doubt we'll see what all this massive clear out of people in Kiev is really all about. And in the meantime, it only remains for me to remind you that you can find all our programs on all our various different platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, Telegram. You can also um, um, support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget to check out our shop and all the great things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all those great things. And last but not least, please remember, if you like this video, to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for the day, more from me soon, and all that remains is for me to wish you a very good day.